Welcome to MongoDB Schema Design Best Practices. Let's jump in here, huh? Okay, just gotta click, there we go. Okay, so first of all, why is schema design so important when you're working on a database? Well, did you know that it's one of the most critical parts about improving performance and stability of any database? It's especially true though for MongoDB, and just a personal opinion, it's one of the things that people get wrong the most when they're setting up a MongoDB database. All right, cool. Well, we're going to jump more into that. Don't worry. Uh, so my name is Joe Carlson. I work for a company called MongoDB, and I'm a developer advocate and software engineer. Uh, if you're at all interested in hanging out with me at all ever again, uh, you can totally hit me up on here. Twitter is the best place to get a hold of me. And if you want any of the links, video, resources, slides, anything, you can find that at that link below, or anytime you see a QR code, that will take you to a page that shows you all of the resources for this talk. Uh, and, oh, I didn't even say this here. So, also, opinions are my own. If I say anything weird, just know that I'm going to be putting lots of my own personal opinions in this talk. Um, all right, so, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, first of all, we're going to be talking about traditional relational SQL type databases and comparing those to MongoDB databases um, and particularly from a schema design approach. Next thing we'll be discussing today is embedding versus referencing. What's the differences and these are the two key ways of organizing a schema with a MongoDB database. And lastly, we're going to be discussing lots of different types of database relationships and how to model those in MongoDB. We're not going to cover all of them today, but this is a introductory course to designing a schema. All right, cool. So, first off, relational versus MongoDB schema design. Uh, the thing I see the most when people are coming from an SQL background to MongoDB is they are designing their MongoDB schemas like they would with their traditional SQL database. Most developers don't see a difference, and a lot of times I see like, hey, Joe, why is my schema performing badly or my database is getting slow? It's because they're designing their schemas in the old way or in the SQL way, right? And that can lead to some performance issues in the future. Um, this is my reaction to right? <laughs> anyone comes to me uh, with this type of database. Okay, so relational schema design, what does that look like? So if you're in charge of an SQL database and you're designing a schema for that relational database, what you're going to be doing is designing your schema independently of the queries you're going to be making with the application using that data, data set or database. The question most devs ask themselves when designing a schema for a relational database is, what data do I have? Whoops, did that go in there? Oh, no, no. Okay, so... Typically, we have a very prescribed approach to doing that, and that's called normalization with a legacy SQL database. And typically, we normalize to the third form. I think there's five forms, four or five, um, but traditionally, most developers are, are normalizing to the third form. So you don't have to know the, about normalization to understand this talk, but I just want to tell you that like normalization means you're trying to dedupe your data as much as possible by splitting it up into separate tables. Cool? So with a relational database, this is a typical user type normalization, right? You have a bunch, you have like a user table and you may have other tables saving data and you're linking that data together using foreign keys. You see there in the professions and cars table, both of those are using a user ID foreign key to match that to the user. Okay, so those are the basics of SQL or relational database schema design. You're probably, if you've never done it before, you're probably at least vaguely familiar that that's what that kind of looks like, right? Rows and columns linking together with foreign keys. Okay, great. So, MongoDB schema design. Hmm? How do we do that? Well, first of all, uh, I, there's a couple things I should tell you. Uh, there's no rules to it. Uh, and if you're used to coming from a relational database, that's going to be kind of tricky. There's no process and there's no pre-prescribed algorithm for how to split up that data. Holy cow. 
<laughs> this can be freeing and kind of scary. So, because there's no rules here. There's no rules. We got no rules in this house. Um, but so if there's no rules, what do we do? Well, schema design for MongoDB is based on the needs of your application. So instead of asking what data we have, we're asking how do we want to use this data? And there's a couple things that we are mostly concerned about when we're designing our MongoDB schema. The first thing is, is we're concerned with how that data, how to store that data, duh, right? We're also concerned with the performance, right? We want to make sure that we're querying and updating and maintaining the correct amount of performance that we need for our application. And we also want to make sure that we're not using a ridiculous amount of hardware and spending way too much money, right? No one wants to spend too much money. Our bosses don't, we don't, my side projects don't, right? We want to try to minimize costs and optimize for performance. So let's say we have the same user table and we want to model the same exact data set in MongoDB. How would we do something like that? Well, if we were going to do this with MongoDB, we'd of course be using MongoDB documents. Uh, and a lot of this stuff, we would just be using keys and values, right? We just save that stuff as key value pairs. First name, last name, surname, cell, whatever, location, whatever, right? We're just saving those key value pairs. But those other tables were saving more data. We might need to do something a little bit differently, right? Because key values are one to one. But if you have that professions and cars data, we need to keep track of, and the user can have multiple professions and multiple cars. We need to model that data a little bit differently. And of course, MongoDB documents, we can save that like we would with any JSON document, with any nesting, with keys or with um, objects or with arrays. So if we had our profession table we had, and a user could have three or like two or more professions, I'd probably just save that as an array, right? We could just have an array of professions we could embed there so that it would show that a user would have more than one profession. Or cars, right? Cars have multiple data now. We have the model in year we also need to keep track of. That makes make sense to have an array of objects to track that data with. My indentation got a little bit weird there, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, okay, cool. So not too bad. Let's do a quick recap here. So first thing we started talking about was starting from a base of relational schema design. I think a lot of us are coming from that way and trying to understand how to do that I think is a helpful place to start. So uh, we discussed relational schema design and we discussed how we traditionally model our data using a normalization uh, and we're modeling our data independent of the queries we need to actually be making. We are then also normalizing in the third form, right? We talked about the rows and columns we have, and then we discussed MongoDB schema design. There's, remember, there's no rules, no process, and no pre-prescribed algorithm for how to actually do that. The things that we're most concerned with when we're designing our schema is how we're actually saving that data and query performance. And of course, we don't want to spend, use too much hardware. The most important thing you can ever can remember when you're designing a schema is you're going to be designing your schema based on the needs of your application. And every application is different and uses data differently. So we're looking at exactly what your database needs and how your application is going to be using that data or modeling your data to optimize for query performance. And the two ways that we do that are through embedding and referencing in MongoDB. So let's discuss what each of them are and then we'll be discussing when to use each of them. So. Embedding, of course, refers to actually embedding that data within our object, right? We can deeply nest arrays, objects, keys, whatever, in any structure that makes sense for us, but we can embed that directly in the document. Referencing, you might recall too from, uh, is similar to a, a join that we make with foreign keys on a legacy SQL relational database. So we're not embedding that data directly in there. We're actually referencing based on keys to make queries that pull together from separate documents or collections. So embedding, why would we want to use embedding? Well, if we're able to embed that document, all that data in a single document, we can get that with a single query. If all the data we need is in one place, we don't have to do any joins. Joins. And if you do not know, joins are very expensive. It's a blocking operation. They tend to be time consuming. And what you, the compiler is doing, 
or the database, when you're making a join in a legacy SQL database, is they are bringing all that data together in memory and then doing a filter or search on that data once it's been joined in memory. This is time consuming, expensive, and if you have huge data sets, this can use up an enormous amount of energy or like computing power in order to get this data. Uh, also, by default, update operations in MongoDB are atomic if you're updating on a single at- document. Um, we, you can have atomic asset compliant operations for multiple documents, which we'll discuss later as well. Okay, so embedding. What are some cons? Well, uh, if you have, if you're embedding all of your data within a document, that could be a lot of overhead and sending lots of data over the wire every single time could be overkill. So the question you should be asking yourself is, do I actually need all this data to be embedded within my document or not? And if not, you might need to actually reference, which we'll talk about in a second. Also, there is a 16 megabyte document limit per MongoDB document, right? So you cannot exceed 16 megabytes per document in MongoDB. And again, if you're getting that close, probably time to start thinking about maybe referencing. I get asked that all the time, like, hey, Joe, my documents are huge. What do I do? It's like, well... That's a code smell in MongoDB. We probably want to look at how we can split that data up and reference it in other in other documents. Okay, so what about referencing, right? Just like you can do a join, but using foreign keys, you can do the same thing in MongoDB. Traditionally, we use a unique identifier or the object ID, and we can do queries that do joins for us, right? Just like you can with a join in a SQL statement. We're splitting that data up into separate documents and doing joins on our queries, updates, or whatever our CRUD operations, right? So why would we want to use referencing over embedding? Of course, we can start splitting up our documents and making those smaller. If you're hitting that 16 megabyte limit, again, probably want to start referencing. And just like you would with a dedupe in normalization with a relational database, you're going to be deduping your data or reducing duplication. That's not to say that deduplication is an anti-pattern either in SQL or MongoDB databases. Don't be afraid of duplicating your data. A lot, of, a common way to increase performance with an SQL database is to denormalize, or that means starting to consolidate your joins in a single data or collection or table, so you don't have to be doing those expensive joins. It makes querying actually much faster. So it's not even a problem in SQL, right? Neither of them. Don't be afraid of deduplicating your data or duplicating your data. Uh, and if, so for example, too, if you have data that you're not accessing often or you don't need every single time you query that document, probably want to yank that off into a separate document and reference that with a reference ID. Okay. So we got some cons now, right? So if you're referencing and you need to get that data, you will have to do joins or lookups in order to retrieve that data, which can slow down your query performance. Okay, cool. So embedding and referencing, the two key ways of designing your schema. That's the building blocks and the question you should be asking yourself is, should I embed this or should I reference it? So embedding is where you embed that data directly in your document. You do not need to have object ID references to look up that data. All the data you need is in one place. And makes it easy to look it up with a single query. You don't have to do any expensive joins and it updates everything with a single atomic operation. All right, on the flip side, we also it also can cause problems if you have large documents and if you're hitting that 16 megabyte document limit, you need to make sure you're we're handling that. In which case, you want to probably reference that with an object ID. You're going to have smaller documents. You're less likely to hit that 16 megabyte limit, which we'll talk about. Maybe you could still could, right? Uh, we're dedupling our data, which is not an anti-pattern, but it does. It is a consideration to make. And we don't have to have all the data every single time, right? If you don't need that data, let's not query it every single time. That's a waste of computing power, space, data transfer over the wire, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, but if you are referencing, just note that you will have to be doing separate lookups in order to get that data, which is a consideration to make when you're considering performance of your database operations. Okay, so let's look at types of relationships you would see when designing a schema. Um, I think it's helpful for us to start in a place where we are designing relationships like we would with a legacy SQL database, which again, I think a lot of us are. If you're not, great, you don't have all that baggage, which is great, but it's still important to understand how these relationships work 
and how we can model them in MongoDB. Uh, we're going to start with the most simple operations and move our way up to more complicated, more interesting, in my opinion, more interesting uh, schemas. So the first one we need to be aware of is one-to-one, -one, right? DJ Khaled would definitely be a big fan of this one, right? We're just adding one single new piece of data to our document. One-to-one -one is really easy for us to create, right? We just have... It's just key value pairs, right? Nothing too com complicated. If you have a single piece of data and a single option for that, using a one-to-one -one relationship with a key value pair is the way to go, right? There's really, use you just use key value pairs. Okay, so that one's pretty easy, but let's get to some more interesting stuff here, right? Uh, we already previewed this one too, but the one-to-few, right? One-to-few would be modeled by perhaps doing an array array of some sort of documents in there. Uh, all right, we have our data all. One to few means that you're not going to have mass amounts of them. So someone could have a couple of addresses, but someone probably doesn't have 16 megabytes of addresses, which might be like eight, you know, millions and millions of, of items in there, right? So we're, those are pretty safe to put in there because it's probably not going to max anything out. So we're just going to embed that right in there. Well, we're going to prefer it, right? There will be a, there could be cases where you don't want to do that, especially if like you're not going to be referencing that very often or don't need it on every single call. But prefer embedding if you have only a couple things you need to be tracking in addition, like more than one. So you want to, I told you there was no rules <laughs> before. I understand the irony of this, but I do have a personal, I have a couple of personal rules I follow when designing a MongoDB schema for a data set or for an application. Um, but I favor embedding. That's my first go-to thing. Uh, unless I can articulate a reason why I do not want to embed it. Right. So just your go-to should be embedding. But if you say like, I don't need this every time. Cool. That's a compelling reason. Or this is too huge. Cool. That's a compelling reason. Let's pull that out and reference it but prefer embedding if possible. Rule two, um, needing to access an object on its own is a compelling reason to embed it. Um, so for example, it's addresses. If another piece of your application is just gonna be using those addresses, even though that's a one to few, you might wanna just split that off. That might be a good call for your application uh, that could increase performance and it could decrease the amount of data being transferred over for that separate query on a different part of your application. Okay, so let's, let's move on out. One to many, one to many relationships. So let's say, for example, you're designing an application for a product and your product that you're keeping track of has lots of parts. So you want to keep track of what these products are and all the separate parts and components that make up this product that we're designing. Maybe we're manufacturing, maybe we're an e-commerce company, maybe we're doing supports. We need to like understand the parts that we're supporting, right? Whatever it is. But we have products, and products are made up of lots of parts. And we need to figure out how to design a schema for this thing. So we have one product that has many parts to it. You see where I'm going with this? So, uh, and potentially that bicycle could have thousands of parts. Or if it's more complicated, like a car or a, you know, a tractor or a Xbox or something, right? These could have thousands and thousands and thousands of parts. That's a many type relationship. Um, so this is the first one where I actually start considering doing a reference. So we have our one product and the product is made up of many parts. In order to reduce the amount of parts that are like, or the data that's being tracked in our product, what I'm doing is doing referencing for each of those parts, but I'm tracking each of those parts within the product. So the part can have lots of different things in there, right? We have quantity, price, cost, name, product number, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We probably don't need that in there. Also, if you're designing an application, let's say you're designing an e-commerce site and you're keeping track of your products and all the parts that make up that, chances are you're going to be using that product information much more often than the parts. Like parts would be something if someone needed support or wanted more information about what made up this product on your e-commerce store, you can make a separate query to go get that. But you probably don't need that every single time. So we've made a call here that we don't actually need the parts all that often, and we're worried about hitting that 16 megabyte limit. So we want to start splitting that up to kind of help us mitigate the risk of going over that limit. But it still works, right? We're matching the IDs 
from the product to the parts. And we can do that many, many times easily and making queries and CRUD operations for all of that. We're going to prefer referencing for this instead of embedding, especially if it's you're hitting thousands and thousands and thousands of sub things in there, right? That'd be the many, right? Okay. So rule three, uh, I want you to avoid joins and lookups if they can, but joins are not an anti-pattern. And if you have a better schema, because you need, and, and it includes a reference, go for it, right? I prefer embedding, but if I can justify a reason to split it up and use joins and lookups, great, go for it. That That's a great use case for your application. It depends entirely on what you are building. Oh, this one's, now we're getting to some fun stuff here. One to squillions. So before with one to many, we're talking like one to like maybe a couple thousand sub parts in there. And we're going to be referencing, but one to squillions on another level. So let's imagine you're building a application for logs, right? And I'm not talking about like timber logs here. I'm talking about like you are being tasked with building a log system for your server farm. And your server farm, if it's blowing up, might be generating thousands or potentially millions and millions and millions, especially over time, right? Depends how verbose your logging system you're designing is. But you could have could have squillions. I know it's a made up word. I don't even know where that word comes from. But you could have potentially squillions of log files for this burning server farm you're building. So how do we build that? Because the problem we have here is that like we could keep track of an array of object IDs like we did with one to many, but an array file growing at the unbounded size, even if it's only tracking object IDs, could potentially run out your 16 megabyte limit, especially if you're leaving your log system on for six months without clearing up that data. That's a that could be a problem. So how do we mitigate that risk? Well, we have a one to squillions relationship you could be developing. So we have a single host file, which would be like a single server instance on your server farm. And we're using, instead of keeping track of all the log files and array in that host, what we're doing is keeping track of the host in the log, right? You see what we're doing here? Each of the logs here has a, it keeps track of the host ID in the log file. That way we don't have to worry about running that unbounded array out to our 16 megabyte limit in our host object. We don't have to worry about that, right? We're doing a reverse reference and we're keeping track of the one host in the log message. And we can do, we can start doing queries just on, if you need to get metadata about that, that host, or we can just do queries on that object IDs and group them, right? We could do all that stuff. No problem. Um, but we're tracking both of those host files or host object IDs in each of the log messages. We're going to obviously prefer referencing here because you could be going massively growing here. So rule four, and I think this is honestly one of the most important ones you can have or one of the most important rules. But um, if you have an array that you think could be growing at an unbounded size without any stop gaps, that is an anti-pattern. That is a code smell. That is, that's, you should tr probably try to avoid that. Um, so anytime you have an array that is growing at unbounded size, like a log file, you want to be referencing and I prefer doing the one to squillions, right? So you don't want to make sure any of those arrays are going to be growing unbounded ever. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, this is the last rep or the last, uh, relationship we'll be discussing here in detail, but uh, I want to discuss a many-to-many -many relationship. So follow me if you will, dear listener, but let's say you are hypothetically designing a to-do list, right? And a to-do item can have many users and a user can have many to-do items, right? We can, let's say we're designing like a Kanban type board and multiple people can be working on a single item on that board at a single time. How do we do this? Well, um, this is where we use a many to many approach. So we have users and we have tasks that we're keeping track of in our system. So a user obviously can have a, a array of tasks that they are responsible for. And these tasks would be correlated with different task documents in there. So we're doing a reference. We're doing an array of references to our tasks. 
And we would also need a another, oops, that didn't show up on there. Oh, well, um, let's see here. I'm just going to show you the point here. So, and then also the tasks then have an array of owners that they're also keeping track of. So with a many to many type relationship, what you're doing is storing that many to many relationship in each of the reference subtasks with each other so that they can each have a many, many to many relationship. So these tasks, for example, they only have one owner and we're keeping track of that owner using that reference ID, but it is possible in the system to have many owners responsible for a single task. So this one's really important too. How you model your data depends entirely on your application's needs, right? There's no rules, but every application has separate needs and how you're using that data dictates how you're going to be designing the schema, right? So what may work for someone else's project may not work for yours. And it depends. It's up to you to make sure that you're taking apart or taking into consideration your performance needs for the application and how you're going to be using that data. Okay. So let's go through it. Types of relationships. The first one we went through today was one to one, right? We're just preferring using embedding. Uh, or uh, using key value pairs, right? Or embedding that data right in the document. Piece of cake, not a problem. One to few, right? Easy. We're just going to be embedding that data within our document, right? We have a subarray with some data in there. It's not going to be growing at a huge rate. You only have a couple items in there. Just throw it in there. Mm -hmm. There we go. Oops. Computer's going slow here. Uh, and then we have the one to many relationship, right? We're having a... Uh, Oh, computer, pause. You would have your one product keeping track of potentially thousands of subparts on there. And we're doing that using referencing and referencing the object ID of the subpart in another document. And we're embedding that object ID of that subpart into a parts array in our one product, one to many. And then we discussed one to squillions, which is really fun, right? Um, we have our, we, and we gave the example of our logging system. So we have a single host document keeping track of all the metadata for that, that server. And then each log file is a separate document and the document keeps track of the host's object ID in it. So we don't have to worry about having an unbounded array appear for us in that host object. And then we had the many to many example. When I gave the example of writing a to do list where multiple users can keep track of multiple items or to do tasks and a task can have multiple owners, right? So you can have many things to do and many people can own a single task. Uh, and we do that by doing arrays of sub reference IDs to all the tasks in the user object. And then in each of the task objects, we're keeping track of all of the owners who own that object in an array, an embedded array. All right, and then we had some rules here today too. So first thing is favor embedding. That's your go-to thing, unless you have a compelling reason not to embed that that, that data. Uh, and basically everything here is about deciding when you want to stop embedding that data, right? And needing to access that data on its own is not a compelling, or is a compelling reason to not embed it or to reference it in a separate document. You want to avoid joins and lookups at, um, if they can be avoided. Um, but it is not an anti-pattern to use them, right? It's not a bad thing to do joints and lookups in MongoDB if you have a compelling reason to use them. It's just, in my experience, most people coming from a normalization approach on just by default will split it up in order to try to normalize their data like they did in SQL. But the very nature of a MongoDB document allows us to be more creative and do more interesting things with our data set, including embedding them. Let's take advantage of it. This is a unique way to save our data. We might as well use it and take advantage of it, right? Uh, no, your array should not grow without bound. If you have an unbounded array anywhere in your data set, let's, let's get rid of that. Let's try to, we're gonna, that's a, that's a huge code smell for me. And lastly, and most importantly, how you model your data depends entirely on the needs of your unique application, right? Everyone has different needs for applications, but yours, these are the most important. Okay, here, home stretch here. What is, uh, let's go through some of the, what we just talked about. One last recap. So the first thing we discussed today was relational database design versus MongoDB schema design. With the relational schema design, what we're doing is modeling our data 
independently of our queries. And typically we do that through normalization to the third form and splitting that data up using foreign keys into separate tables and columns and data sets, right? And we're doing joins on those foreign keys to bring that data together. With MongoDB schema design, no rules, no process, no algorithms we can follow. Um, we're just worried about how we're saving that data and query performance based on the needs of our application. Okay, so there's two key ways of us designing the schema for application. That's either embedding that data directly in the document or referencing it with an object ID. So if you embed it, obviously you're just sticking that data directly in that database, right? That'd be the equivalent of doing a join on data sets with a relational database or data set. And get all that data, all that's there, single query, super fast, atomic operations. But you have to be aware of data growing at massive, massively and growing out of the bounds of that document or getting too much data that you do not actually need, right? And if that's the case, then you want to make sure you're referencing that data using object IDs and using joins and lookups. So you get smaller documents, you're deduping your data, again, not a code smell, and you can access, uh, we're reducing the size of the data going over. So you're not overfetching any data for your users or for your app, which would slow it down. Um, but you do have to be aware that you are going to be making queries and lookups, which can slow down and decrease performance of your application. Okay. Then the next thing we did was we discussed a bunch of SQL type relationships that we can also use. So we have the one-to-one, -one. awesome. We're gonna use key value pairs just to keep track of all the data together. Uh, if you have a one-to-few, so that's just like a subarray, we're just gonna embed that in the data set. If it's not too huge, just embed it. One-to-many, right? This is where it starts growing largely, and we gave the example of that product having many sub parts. And we're using referencing on those object IDs to make sure that we're not gonna be getting too big. And for the needs of this application, we didn't actually need to let part data every single time. We, it may only be a unique part of our application. It may be overkill to get that every single time. And then we gave the example of one to squillions with our log files and many to many with our to-do lists. And we'll skip through this really fast here, but I just want to point out this one last part again. If you're going to take anything away from this talk, what I want you to remember is when you're modeling a schema for MongoDB databases and for your application, just know that every database schema design is different and it depends on the unique needs of your application. Consider how you're going to be querying that data or using it, and you need to figure out what performance needs you need for your application, and you're gonna be designing your schema based on those requirements. Then that's it, right? There's no pre-prescribed approach. Every need is different. Okay, questions. Um, I'm in the chat too if you have any questions. And what's next? So, um, if I've inspired you at all in this talk uh, and you want to get involved or learn more, um, you should know that we have the MongoDB University, which you can totally check out there. Um, we have the MongoDB Developer Hub, developer.mongodb.com. Um, it's a place where you find amazing blog posts, articles, cool to do things, um, examples, getting started guides, quick start guides, it's amazing. And uh, if you want to take advantage of our MongoDB University, I'd recommend, if you haven't started with the M001 or their, like Intro to MongoDB course, uh, and you want to learn more about MongoDB schema design, because we just scratched the surface here today, uh, but I recommend taking the M320 course on data modeling. It's a great place to learn more about database design. Lastly, too, if I've inspired you all to want to get better at schema design or MongoDB or just be a better developer, what I'd recommend is just getting out there and doing it, right? Just on your next project, spin up a MongoDB database and just use it on your back end, but practice it. Going to these talks is a good way to learn if this is something you're interested in learning more about, but in order to fully grok a new piece of tech, I think the best way to do that is to actually build it, figure out what errors are going to come up, like just do it. There's tons of resources for you from MongoDB, but get out there and build something. Build something just for you, right? But try to use it. And if you want $100 in free MongoDB credits, use code JOEK100, or you can scan that little QR code uh, for a bunch of free credits. 
you want to work for MongoDB, we're always hiring, baby. We're always hiring. Um, check out the MongoDB careers. That's careers.mongodb.com or go to joecarlson.dev slash MongoDB careers. Here's a bunch of resources I'd also recommend checking out. Again, my name is Joe Carlson. I work for MongoDB and it has been a pleasure chatting with all y'all today. Uh, if I've, if you want to hang out with me ever again, best place to do that is on Twitter. I also make dumb jokes on TikTok and I stream on the MongoDB Twitch stream every Friday at noon Eastern time. Thank you so much, everyone. You're the best. Ooh, I love you. You're great. Oh, so good. See you next time.